Good afternoon, Street Fighters. Uh, I'm Andrew Shotland, your host, uh, president of Local SEO Guide. We do SEO probably for some of you. Um, the last time I was up on the stage last year, uh, uh, the Street Fighters asked me to uh, interview the, uh, what was it, Grinder and Tinder, I believe. Yeah, Grinder and Tinder um, on all sorts of interesting local stuff. Um, and for some reason, they thought that that experience might make it uh, relevant for me to interview um, on-demand delivery, which I think is slightly relevant. Uh, so we're going to have a little chat about what these uh, stellar companies are doing. Um, first, why don't you guys go around and introduce yourself? Let's start with Holger. Yeah, sure. My name is Holger Ludov. I uh, am responsible for business development and partnerships at Postmates. Hi, uh, I'm Prahar Shah. Um, I run BD at, I guess, the Tinder for food, DoorDash. I like it. Yeah. I like it. My name is Sarah Masteracco. I lead business development for Instacart in our Western region. Great. Uh, so welcome. Um, uh, so all of you are doing uh, on-demand delivery for food. Uh, to your, uh, mostly in restaurants, right, you guys? And then supermarkets, right, groceries? Um, I guess the first thing I'd like to start with is uh, the challenge I think we all have in creating these marketplaces and platforms is the chicken and egg problem. How did you guys get these things off the ground? Uh, Holger, you want to? You wanna yeah, so first of all, I think I just want to react to what you said. So we are actually uh, more of a generalist, right? Okay. We do uh, food, but we also do a lot of retail and groceries as well. Right. Um, I think the way it came about for us is that we originally started as a, actually a pure messaging company uh, or a messenger company for, for consumers. And then we saw people asking our messengers like, hey, go to McDonald's and pick up two Big Macs and we'll pay you when you deliver them. And then we realized, oh, wait a second, if we would only give our customers access to all merchants uh, in, a, you know, in any one of our markets, and if we would only give them an ability to, to pay for it as well, uh, kind of in a seamless way, that's, that was kind of the, the magic um, kind of angle, I guess, that we, we eventually got to. But I guess to your question, yeah, I think you know, we are definitely working in a three-sided marketplace, right? There's the Postmates, our courier, the customer, and the merchant. And in order for this all to work, it's like demand and, um, and supply, our, our fleet kind of need to grow in tandem. And um, there's, I don't think there's kind of a silver bullet, just like Uber and Lyft uh, did this on the transportation side and kind of slowly ramped this up. I think probably all of us are doing the same thing uh, on, the, on the delivery side. Prahar, you want to take a shot? Sure, at? I'm going to steal our joke from earlier today. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? The VC came first. <laughs> um, you know, I think... Uh, <laughs> Actually, the answer was which one was funded. <laughs> right. Um, so I think, you know, for us, uh, uh, DoorDash started when uh, we really wanted to write software for small businesses. So that was the genesis of our company. And, um, you know, I think for us, it was delivery just became one of those really challenging problems for small businesses. And, um, you know, our, our founders uh, were working at a lot of these small businesses and realized that delivery was uh, one of the things that they didn't start their business for, right? They, when, uh, when they were uh, creating a cupcake shop, they weren't thinking, hey, I want to become a FedEx or a UPS. So um, I think that's sort of where it started. And um, we, we spent a lot of time early on with uh, working with these small businesses, partnering with them, uh, creating software for them. Uh, we have over 20 different software products, uh, and half of those are dedicated to merchants. Um, so I think you know, it's, it's easy to say the chicken and egg and that you, know, you sort of just went there and sold, uh, uh, re delivered for restaurants, but the partnership was very important for us, uh, still continues to be, and I think as we continue to expand, we write a lot of software products for a lot of our clients, our merchants. Sure. So Instacart was founded by Apoor Mehta, who's a former Amazon fulfillment engineer that had an idea, didn't like going to the grocery store, um, and felt like he could use his fulfillment background to apply that to grocery stores. One Y Combinator, which VC helps. Um, but from a, when thinking about Instacart, um, related to Postmates, there are three key stakeholders. There's customers, obviously, shoppers, and retailers. Um, when we first started with the customers and the shoppers, really proving our model, especially in grocery, which is an extremely uh, conservative industry and also has seen the Cosmos and Webvan downfall, there's some, there's, there was really some hesitancy getting in. We proved our model and said, hey, customers really want this. We're growing very quickly. And then about a year and a half ago, really started building strong strategic partnerships with grocery stores. So slightly pivoting our model, but really that was our, our vision. Um, and now we um, are developing customer relationships, maintaining our shoppers, but really developing strategic partnerships. In grocery, um, now uh, with Petco, we have a, a slight, really groceries for your pet, um, but a natural extension of that. So do you, 
if, when we spoke, I think you said you have your, um, you have people actually sitting in grocery stores, right, waiting to get orders, and then they go and pick stuff off the shelves. Is that accurate? Yes. So Whole Foods, for example, if you were to go to the Whole Foods at 4th and Harrison, I believe, um, the one in Pack Heights as well in San Francisco, we've split uh, the value chain, if you will. So we have people dedicated to shopping and people dedicated to delivering. Uh, really uh, minutes per item, right? It's, it's all about efficiency and accuracy. So making sure the order is accurate. Um, people are trained in Whole Foods, show up there. Uh, really not a lot of downtime, right? Um, shopping as quickly as they can, staging that order in a fridge, freezer, and shelf, and then delivery drivers coming to pick it up and deliver that order. So, so have you guys figured out like the most efficient way for someone to run through a grocery store and get stuff? Um, I would say it's it's all it, it's a constant uh, learning curve. Uh, right. We're not done, but we are constantly getting faster and faster, and it's down to uh, having that aisle mapped, so we know right. exactly in the aisle. Getting nightly feeds to know what's available, but even studying that to understand is it really available. You know, if a shopper can't find it three times, should we hide it and not let it to be available for pickup? Got it. So it seems like this is, it, uh, in one sense, these businesses are really huge. Um, operation efficiency models, um, and it's like shaving time and sense off of these things is really what makes it work. Holger, I think I read, maybe it was on Postmates where you guys had done um, something called Turbo, I think, does that sound correct? Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so we can actually anticipate kind of based on, um, you know, the millions of deliveries we've done so far, and because we've done deliveries from I think 80,000 plus locations, we actually have historical data for our most popular places in terms of how long, for example, the food prep time is or how long it is actually to get, uh, you know, grocery items uh, assembled. And kind of based on that, we can actually drive efficiencies into our fleet to dispatch um, somebody to pick up the order just in time when, you know, when the order is ready. So that's kind of the, the notion of Turbo. So you guys have like a sense, like we know it takes a guy on average, 10 minutes to make, um, you know, Kung Pao chicken or something. Right. Well, it actually, I think it goes even one level deeper, right? Uh, you take a place like, uh, I don't know, Farina Pizza here in San Francisco. We know that their pizza prep time is actually different on a Friday night. It might be 35 minutes, whereas on Friday at lunchtime, it's actually only 20 minutes. Got it. And prior, do you guys do similar optimizations like that? Yeah, we do. So I think, uh, you know, we were the first to come up with this algorithm concept. Um, you know, we, we looked at the market initially and we said, uh, the way the courier system currently works, it was sort of based on the Uber model, right? So you press a button and sort of the closest one uh, accepts the delivery and then they go. I think we looked at it as it should actually be the entire opposite way, right? That uh, the closest person, the closest uh, you know, dasher in our case, is not the best uh, person to pick up that delivery. Um, if the prep time, for example, is 20 minutes for a restaurant, then uh, someone that's 20 minutes away should actually get that delivery. So um, I think a lot of that is something that uh, we've spent a lot of time on, and there's probably over 25 different variables in this algorithm that we've created. Uh, the founders were at Stanford, and, and literally like our first six engineers were uh, PhDs from Stanford's uh, machine learning lab. So um, I think we've spent a lot of time getting at the ingredient level um, to understand uh, the whole side of the delivery from the, the dasher. And the other thing, we have efficiency scores for every single dasher. So we look at um, from the moment that they accept the delivery to the moment they get the restaurant, how long should that take and how long did it take? And over the whole span of data, we're actually able to see that this is a better dasher and, and, and we're able to act as such. Um, so. so you guys are building, I, I can't really put my finger up, there's something freaky about what you're building. Because um, like, I'm just picturing sometimes, maybe it's like Blade Runner in the future or something, where I'm walking along and there's someone pinging me, turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right, like, go, like optimizing my every friggin' move, right? Because that's really kind of what you're building, right? Am I smoking something or? <laughs> um, so do you guys have a, a, are these couriers or dashers or whatever you're calling them, carters, um, are they employees or are they freelancers? All our, our, all our uh, Postmates are actually independent contractors. Mm -hmm. Most of them actually are working part-time. So they're between jobs, or maybe they're students. Um, you know, the interesting thing with us is that we actually have a mixed fleet. So we have people in cars, we have people on bikes, on scooters, and so forth. And so people can use whatever kind of transportation vehicle they, they kind of want to use. Right. How about you guys? Yeah, we're in the same situation. Um, one of the things, so part of this algorithm that we look at is... Um, so in some cases, uh, an item will be bike friendly. In other cases, it won't. So for example, if an order is $80, right, you're probably not going to be able to take that order on a bike. 
Um, but uh, if it's a small order and it doesn't have things that are going to flip over, uh, then a bike is perfect for that. So part of that algorithm looks at, uh, uh, and, and we actually do capacity planning as well on our site. So uh, we know exactly how many uh, drivers in a car, how many bikers, how many scooters um, we need uh, in a given market. Uh, our algorithm is also uh, to the point where it's at a neighborhood level. So um, you know, take like Chicago's Lincoln Park is very different than uh, you know the Mission, for example. So, uh, so we'll take all of that into account when we're uh, work, we're basically developing this algorithm for each neighborhood. What about you, Sarah? What about the Carters? Is that what they call them? Personal shoppers. Personal shoppers. That's what we call them. Um, call them Carters. It's better. <laughs> um, our personal shoppers are all independent contractors. They can work zero hours or 40 hours. Again, people looking for a flexible part-time wage. Uh, right. We do train them, though, to be great shoppers, to pick produce, uh, to use our app to make sure they communicate. At the end of every personal shopping order, you get that phone call. It's part of that concierge experience. Um, but we've heard from them that they also like like having the flexibility of working as many hours as they choose. Got it. And there, so there's been a little bit of um, media, um, I don't know, spotlight shine on, shown on, on Uber drivers who maybe are not the greatest people in the world and shouldn't have been driving me somewhere. Um, what do you guys do to make sure your, your contractors are, you know, pass a certain, I don't know, civility bar? Let's put it that way. Yeah. So on, on our side, we, you know, pre-vet these people, they all go through background checks and so forth, they're all being trained. A lot of our, our Postmates have done thousands of, of deliveries before, and they're all like also incentivized to do a, a very high quality delivery because they're actually getting a tip in the end. Right. So there's certain mechanisms that we have, and, and by the way, we also rate every single delivery, right? So every single delivery can be rated through a five-star rating system. People can leave little texts um, you know, after the delivery um, kind of based on whether the Postmates was friendly, whether the delivery came in, in, in tact and in, in quality. And so we actually monitor that, and we also have our local teams engaging directly with the fleet if we see kind of any discrepancies with our kind of quality standards. Yeah, so uh, DoorDash is in 50 cities across the U.S., and uh, we've got dashers everywhere. Um, uh, we definitely, so we go through the same, uh, we use Checker, I think it's uh, pretty standard in the industry to uh, leverage their API to do these background checks. Um, uh, we'll uh, also uh, give them insurance as well, so that's something that we have an umbrella insurance for uh, every dasher. Um, and then one of the things that we also try to do uniquely is um, when, and when a delivery is happening, there's certain things that can happen, you know, so Take, take food delivery 40 minutes from start to finish, right? And there's probably 20 things that could go wrong, right? You order food, we were talking about Indian food the other yeah. day, and you decide, hey, like, I want an extra piece of naan, or uh, I want less garlic in my uh, you know, butter chicken. Um, those are all things that happen in those 40 minutes, and uh, for us, we have to adjust in, in a very small amount of time. So right. um, one of the things that we do, and, and the algorithms built for this, is anticipate issues as they come. Um, so, for example, if we know that a dasher is uh, slow to respond or accept the order or slow to get to the restaurant, these are all things that we, uh, we have the algorithm uh, basically raise as red flags. Right. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll be able to communicate to them, whether it's text message, phone call. Um, so I think that's something that's really helped us look at overall quality. And uh, ultimately, our, our goal is to you know, have 0% lateness. Our right now, uh, funny sad, our, our, um, our deliveries are more on time than FedEx and UPS, uh, but there's still lateness, and uh, we still have to fix that. Right. Yeah. Same with background checks. Um, I think the other thing we do to set our shoppers up for success is have a shopper happiness team. So there's customer happiness. As a customer, if you have a problem with your order, there's a customer happiness team. We have a shopper happiness team to say, you know, if their car broke down or if um, the customer is not home, what do you do? So we're setting people up for success. They're star rated, obviously, and when they are rated, we understand if that star was related to their performance or not. Um, so constantly um, evaluating them. If there's a problem, obviously, we don't use that shopper again. Right. Um, but also just supporting them to set themselves up for a five-star experience. Yeah, it seems like there's, um, I, doing some research, particularly around Postmates, it seems like there's actually a little community online of people who are like, here's how to be the, you know, here's how to get your, um, your pick up your deliveries for Postmates the most optimal way. And yeah, no, we definitely encourage that, right? Yeah. I think there's community teams in every single market, and we want the Postmates, especially the, the more experienced ones, to kind of pass on some of that information and experience right. to, uh, to some of the newer people. So that's definitely encouraged. So, so let's talk uh, business model. How do we make money, or how do we take other people's money or something? Um, uh, it seems to me you guys all operate on a, hey, we charge the consumer very little, and then 
we kind of take it on the back end. Is that generally how it works? So uh, I feel like I'm always starting, but I'll, <laughs> I'll throw it out there uh, since there's no particular You're a good order. Starter. So I think we have two. We have really two core models. We have the Postmates app, the way we are driving um, deliveries. You know, you basically select from any merchant in your city, and then. Uh, we deliver to you in under an hour. I think the average delivery time is actually 35 minutes. And f currently, I would say that experience is actually a premium experience because the, the bulk of the, the fees are actually being uh, paid by the consumer. Now, we've changed our model in that we now also have a lot of like, direct restaurant relationship, especially on the, on the food side. And, you know, and we're actually leveraging some of the, the commissions that we're getting from our merchants to lower the delivery fees. So that's very true. But we ultimately strive to be a non-demand logistics player, kind of like a UPS for urban logistics. Right? And so when the partnerships that we've announced with uh, people like Starbucks and uh, you know, what you've read about Apple, for example, the other day, those are deliveries that we're powering out of a third-party experience, like the Starbucks app. And in that case, it's a very different model. It's actually more of a classic carrier model. Um, right. And so the consumer in that case may be charged by one of our partners, but we're getting, we're getting paid kind of on a de uh, per delivery basis, similar to how they would be paying a US Postal Service or a UPS. The, the Starbucks thing seemed kind of weird to me, because is it, is, are the deliveries typically like, oh, I'm ordering one of those party Starbucks or something? No, like, no, 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 I, will, I, I can't go into too much detail, obviously, because it hasn't launched yet, right. but um, ultimately you will be able to order Starbucks both from the Postmates app and from the Starbucks app, and I think what we've showed at their shareholder meeting is when we launch this later this year in Seattle, no, you will be able, like right now, I think in the Pacific Northwest, you can al already do what Starbucks is referring to as mobile order pay, which is you, you pre-order and then you pay with your store value card and you get your loyalty points and you pick it up yourself. And in the future, there will be a, a you know, Postmates powered delivery and these will be very, very quick deliveries, but it will be anything, right? From an espresso drink to pastries and so forth. All right. Sign me up. <laughs> um, so we have a very similar business model. Um, uh, we initially worked a lot with uh, these, as I mentioned, small businesses. And um, you know, if you look at the older models of Seamless or Grubhub, it was typically this commission-based model. So um, you know, the restaurants uh, don't typically want to increase their menu prices or, or have uh, you pay a premium for, uh, for delivery. So they're willing to, take, uh, to pay a commission on that. Um, I think as we're seeing in different, uh, different restaurants, different types of restaurants, um, some, um, some say, listen, if the demand is there, if people are willing to pay uh, $10 for a Starbucks latte, uh, you know, then, then the demand is there and we'll, we'll, we'll fulfill it. So, uh, so we have a similar model, uh, both commission and uh, a markup to a consumer. And, and you gave me a stat on the phone the other day. What, you said you're, uh, the average merchant is seeing a, uh, some percentage growth in, um, was it margin or orders? Sure. So um, on, uh, on a top line basis, in terms of incremental transaction volume, uh, we're seeing anywhere from 10% to 30% top line. And then when you look at it from a bottom line, uh, you're not, you're not ex adding any real estate. You're not adding any extra bodies typically. So uh, you're basically taking that's the kitchen that you have, the back end that you have, and just pumping out more food, right? right? So it's like the most efficient for these guys. And so from a bottom line, you'll see 40%, 50% improvement. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so Sarah, um, what do you, you guys charge at the top end? Five ninety nine for delivery, right? Is that for one hour, three ninety nine for two hour, or any hour after that? So that seems like incredible, an incredible value for getting like ten bags of groceries, right? Definitely is, and for ninety nine dollars, you can get any two hour plus delivery for uh, over the year. Um, and when we were founded, it's like, oh, that's like Instacart Prime, uh, like Instacart Express. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so with that, yes, it is. It's a, a very small amount. Um, we have direct relationships with our retailers. When we were founded, that wasn't the case. When we were founded, we didn't have these relationships. We had to prove the model. We set our own prices, often with a markup. We're more than 50% away from that. Um, our model today, and what we believe is strong going forward, is to be the turnkey e-commerce platform for grocery retailers of any size, local, regional, national. With that, they pay us. Um, per delivery often. It's a, it's a pay for performance model. So we get paid from them, we get paid from our customers, um, and that's how we pay our shoppers. Got it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of particularly interested in the restaurant vertical because it seems like there's, what, 50, 50 different, like, hey, I can order my, my, my Thai chicken tonight apps. Um, and it seems to me very um, similar to what we constantly talk about at these conferences of, the merchant is bombarded with options that all seem the same and they don't understand. And how do you, how do you convince them that you're different? How do you get their attention? And how do you do that in a way that's profitable? 
I'll start. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a few things. I think one, um, when, when that dasher comes in, so there's 50, let's say, flavors of dashers, right? Um, I think that's where you, as a merchant, you see the difference, right? The professionalism of the dasher, the happiness, the friendliness. Um, majority of our dashers have some sort of customer experience background, so uh, that's sort of how we recruit them. Um, majority of them wear t-shirts like this, so uh, you're able to identify them. Um, you know, given that the algorithm generally gets you there right when they're supposed to be there, you're not uh, basically taking your, uh, your existing real estate and having a bunch of people in red shirts standing out. Which, so these are little things that we spend a lot of time on, um, and, and that definitely differentiates, I think. You know, the other thing is um, we pride ourselves on really focusing on the end-to-end -end customer experience, and you know, for example, our average, what we call restaurant to consumer time, uh, is less than nine minutes. So from the moment that you get your uh, food at the restaurant to the moment it gets delivered to you, your Indian food, uh, it'll be less than nine minutes. Uh, we have these hot bags and these space blankets uh, that all the food goes into. So I think these are the small things that for us, we're exclusively focused on food delivery. So that's something that um, we've, from the very beginning, said, if we can get food right, you can do everything else. Um, so, but, but how many door dashes can a, your typical restaurant work with? Is it infinite or is it they're really going to pick one or two and... I mean, it could be infinite, right? You could right. work with all 40 I of guess them. what are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, I think what we end up finding is that they'll start off trying a few um, just to get a better sense on, you know, who... You don't really get to feel the experience until you work with them. Um, I think we've had many cases where that restaurant will then just single source and say, uh, A, I'm, I'm getting more orders than I can handle, so thank you. Uh, the dashers are professional, they're friendly, and, uh, and this works for us. We're not getting customer complaints, and so you're extending our brand through DoorDash to the customer. So um, I think they end up choosing maybe one, maybe two at the end. Got it. What about you, what about you Hogarth? Um, yeah, I think we go, we go about it slightly differently in that we did not originally start out with direct merchant relationships, right? We are now building these, and it's a relatively straightforward conversation because in many cases for some of the most popular restaurants in any one of our, I don't know, 28 metro markets, I don't know, it's like 80, 90 or so cities, we, um, what we do is, you know, we go to these merchants and we can basically prove to them like, hey, we've already driven sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue f with them without them really even being aware that they were working with Postmates, right? Because our Postmates, in a way, act like any other customer going in and making the purchase. Um, and then, you know, basically having these people sign up and in order to get even more transaction, improving their, you know, kind of the operational processes and so forth is, is actually very straightforward. But so we went about it in a different way in that we originally did not have merchant relationships until probably six months ago. Got it, got it. Um, got a little bit more time. I'm curious, do you, do you guys give out numbers? Can we talk about how much money we're making, revenue, anything? Maybe? I can only say what we've said publicly in okay. 2014. Instacart grew 10x, doubled in the fourth quarter, um, and uh, grossed or $100 million in revenue to our retail partners. So, so that's a real kind of business, real kind of business. How about you, Prahar? You yeah, sure. So uh, uh, something that's public, one in three households uh, in the Bay Area uh, use DoorDash. So, yeah. One in three? Yeah. That's insane. I think we're making, you know, we've generated more than 2 million deliveries so far. You know, I think we're making hundreds of thousands of deliveries every month at this point. Uh, we, you know, I, I mean, from when I joined the company uh, just about a year ago, it's been, it's been a, kind of a huge growth. Uh, that's all I can say. At this point. Fair enough. Uh, would anyone like to ask our esteemed panelists any questions? There's a hand back there. Shout it out. Sorry, could you repeat what it said? It, it never leave home again. Never leave, never, never leave home again. Never. That, it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> if all you do is eat, then yes, you definitely de never need to leave home again. Uh, we may have, yeah. We so we have we have uh, local teams in every city, uh, and we empower them to do uh, any grassroots marketing, any guerrilla marketing. Uh, we had a team that went out and flyered uh, Stanford this weekend. So uh, I haven't seen all of them, but uh, I think it's funny. Yeah, shut-ins are a key target market of the young man. So <laughs> no big surprise. W one in one shut-in uses yeah. DoorDash. Yeah, we own the shut-in market. Okay, yeah. 
Hi, Anna from the NRA. Uh, the other one, Buns Not Guns. Um, hey, Prahar. Um, Did so you say Buns Not Guns? Buns Not Guns. Okay. Restaurants, not rifles. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking of another bun. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my question uh, for you two right here is, um, how are you making sure that the restaurants are not receiving negative reviews based on any sort of bad delivery experience that someone may have received? Are you searching the review sites to make sure? We're not necessarily searching the review sites, but we're definitely very open ears when we talk to, uh, when we work with the restaurants. So we have actually a dedicated customer support team for all of our merchants, right? If stuff like that comes up, usually in our case, what happens is these are our customers primarily. They actually leave feedback with us and we can actually address that. You know, there may be situations where we would, uh, you know, reimburse a customer for uh, an order that went wrong and what have you. But we are not actually seeing a lot of issues with people going to other third party sites like Yelp or so and leaving, um, leaving uh, feedback there. Mainly we actually keep the feedback, but we are actually also sharing the feedback with our merchants, right? So especially with some of the large merchants that we've signed up, um, it's actually part of our kind of general policy to share the customer feedback so that they can actually have a handle and a sense for how you know, high quality these, these uh, deliveries actually are for them. Hi, Anna. So um, one of the things that we do, um, so first of all, the, uh, similar to Postmates, uh, we, we have our own Yelp page, for example. So uh, if you go uh, check out DoorDash on Yelp, you'll see four stars, uh, and that's something that we pride ourselves in. Um, secondly, what we uh, also do is we basically share most of this data with, uh, with the restaurant. So we have a dedicated merchant portal um, that uh, each of our restaurant partners can log into. Um, we're super techies. We've got Chardio's up the ass, um, and uh, and and similar uh, to uh, our our partners, they will basically get access to all of this data. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, we measure something on how long is uh, the dasher. Uh, waiting in the store to receive the food, right? Because this whole algorithm is based on uh, just extreme efficiency. So um, if we start seeing that number go above some standard means, uh, you know, distributions of, uh, of our mean, then that's something that we'll address together. And we have an account management team that will literally have me very metrics-driven conversations with our, um, uh, with our partners. Um, and, uh, and then similarly, on the Dasher side, again, we're looking at efficiency scores. We're looking at how long should it have taken you from uh, the restaurant to the home and uh, how long did it take you? And then these are things that will, and they love getting this feedback. Like they all love knowing what their reviews and what their, uh, what their star ratings are. Um, and they want to improve. So these are things we do together. Yeah. Anyone? Okay, maybe time for one more. Um, oh, this one's for you. Uh, I asked uh, some of my team members uh, what they thought of these services. And one of them said they're a dedicated Postmates user. Um, and they said they use it because there are so many promotions they basically are just getting free stuff all day long. So I'm curious how many people, like, it seems like a lot of what you do is very promotional driven. Um, like I just saw something like you're delivering Vogue magazines. And um, so I, I'm curious, like what's, yeah. what's going on there? Yeah, that's, uh, it's a good observation. So we definitely work with a lot of partners, especially, you know, kind of food merchants in any one of our city and drive these promotions. It's actually mainly kind of awareness building for the merchant that they're actually available for delivery on Postmates. Um, so we are not, we don't see ourselves in the business of subsidizing our deliveries, right? It's kind of a core service. It's actually also something that's core to our company. Um, but if partners do want to promote, we are happy to kind of give them access to our customers. Um, if they are, they can basically um, subsidize the delivery fees. They can subsidize the, the food. Um, but we actually use it to grow our markets, and the, and the merchants obviously are using it to you know, make, make themselves um, kind of aware to uh, Postmates customers. One of the things I'd add, um, and at least this is the experience here at DoorDash, and I'll share with each of you, is avoid free if you can. Um, we've seen that free is probably the driver of some of the worst customers. Uh, we've definitely seen people who are going you know, from food to food to promotion to promotion when they're getting free food. Um, you know, even if you're making them pay just a dollar or something uh, to opt in, to buy in, to, to say that I care about this service, uh, that's something that at least we've seen. Uh, and so you won't see as many free promotions from DoorDash, but uh, we'll have a lot of different promotions uh, trying to cater ourselves and attract the best customers that will have sort of lifetime value with us. So don't take any more orders from Dan Leapson. It's Dan Leapson. He's, he's, he only look, is looking he for is the free stuff. He is you guys. Yeah, we, um, we actually don't do free stuff as well. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I think we are pretty much out of time. Uh, thank you guys all. Very uh, interesting businesses. Congratulations. Thank you.